Welcome to Too Deep Hokies Under the Influence, a Sons of Saturday podcast. I'm your host, PP. And as always, I got my co host, Sam Jesse, here. And if you're watching on YouTube, I've got a third guest, co host, whatever you want to call him tonight. Coach Mike Holmes from the Hokie Hitter has joined us. Mike, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's uh, I've been a longtime listener going all the way back to the mid teens when y'all started and uh i love everything in the hokey space so thanks for having me on yeah we've been talking about this for a while trying to get mike on figuring out when the best time was and he had some observations that he kind of was texting to me and sam and i was like you know what we got to do this now this is the perfect time and so he's going to help us break down the spring game everything you guys saw on saturday sam and i were in town we had fun we'll talk about that but for now sam start us off with the cheers well, you know, usually our cheers are very uh, jovial and things like that, but we're recording this uh, Tuesday, April 16th at about 8.04 p.m. And, you know, obviously Virginia Tech April 16th is a day that is in the minds of a lot of Hokies and for, for all the wrong reasons, but in some ways, all the right reasons. It's something that brought Hokie Nation together permanently. And I think is, you know, something that is still talked about openly between Hokie Nation and with memories and you know we come together every spring to to remember those who were lost on april 16th 2006 and also to you know i think live out our lives in the best way that we can for them and there are so many great community uh, events that happen in blacksburg around the time you have the run 3.2 for 32 run which had this is crazy over eighteen thousand runners for the 3.2 for and sam was one of them And I was one of them. Uh, Yeah. You have the spring game. um, Always play a baseball and softball game that night. Baseball's playing Radford right now. Uh, Softball's playing UVA. I think just the way that the Hokie community comes together on April 16th is really, really beautiful. And it makes me very, very proud to be a Hokie. Yeah. Cheers to that, man. Yeah, it was... You know, it, that weekend and the spring game weekend being so close to April 16th, it offers a lot of opportunity to honor those who we lost. And the 3.2 432 is a great event. And I know at the finish line, you said there was Coach Pry and, and several players there, like high fiving people, correct? Yeah. And the players that weren't at the finish line were actually lined up in Lane Stadium. You run through the tunnel and you run down the home sideline and then cut across the away tunnel. And then go back through, um, you know, to Center Street behind Stadium Woods. The entire team is part of it. Um, not only them, but you have, you know, uh, acapella groups singing the fight song. You have marching Virginians lined up there. So uh, they really go all out. And it's if, even if you don't run, even if you walk it, highly, highly recommend signing up. Yeah. So let's talk about spring spring game weekend and, and Mike uh, feel free to jump in if you want to, I know you weren't around, but uh, if you have any <laughs> I was questions, there in spirit. <laughs> yeah, man, I know we were missing you. And uh, it was so much fun. Dude, spring jam was awesome. The boys did a great job getting that together. I know they were dog tired that night and into the next morning, uh, particularly maybe our, our friend, Billy Ray Mitchell was, uh, was cutting loose because of all that work he had put in to get guys like Tyrod there and the Edmonds brothers and coach price and Bud Foster and so many more that showed up. It is just, just being a regular fan of tech for a long, long time. Like it makes me feel cool being there around all those guys that have accomplished so much with our program, you know, like it is. And I know Sam, me and you were working the door together and just seeing the people coming in, you're like, wow, I can't believe this person's here. And this person insane amount of people. Like over, probably over 400 people walk through those doors that night. I would imagine so. Yeah. uh, That's probably a low balling it. And just to see everybody there hanging out as a community, it's not, you know, the players and coaches sit over here and everyone else is over there. No, it's a bunch of intermingling, talking, telling stories, buying drinks for each other. If you're there next year, you need to come. You need to come. I need to have a, I have a question for Mike is that if you, you're at the spring jam and there's one former hokey that's still with us alive. Who would you want to talk to? Who would you most want to bend the ear of for a minute? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, that's it's kind of hard to put on spot. I actually would love to talk uh, with Jake Grove. <laughs> nice. Uh, you know, that's uh, a good former, one. Former offensive lineman, all American, but I, 
being a football coach, I love talking to the linemen uh, because they're the unsung heroes. I feel like they don't get all the pub that the Tyrods and the Michael Vicks of the world that they get. Those linemen, though, they're the nitty gritty. They, they're the ones that make it happen. So I think Jay Grove, plus he was a straight up dog. When yeah, he, was he was there, he, he was known as he was like the most nasty lineman that we've ever had. And I just I just like to get into his brain a little bit and pick it. Yeah, I got to talk to JC for a second, and that was really cool to me. Like just he's a very large man and getting to talk to JC Price, a, a hokey player. Great. And now really doing a great job on the D line. Like that was really cool for me. I saw Will Stewart, Chris Coleman, talk to them for a little bit. Uh, so many more Silas Janzi walked in and oh my God, he is just gigantic. <laughs> uh, I, so many I will, big men. <laughs> I will never get over how big Tremaine Edmonds is. Like, oh, yeah. It's shocking. It is truly, yeah. truly shocking. And, uh, but everyone's like super nice, super friendly, excited to be there, happy to be there. You know, what we hear from the players all the time is just how thankful and appreciative they are of, of having a space to come back to campus and having all that facilitated to them. They have a, a Letterman's banquet as well. And, and the golf tournament, other, a, the golf tournament. Yes. I mean, the monogram course. club has come a long way since mm-hmm. the complaints we used to hear about player relations with the former players. I think it's, it's come a long way and uh, Hey, me and you got to shake Tyrod's hand, Sam. So that was pretty cool too. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, yeah. it's it's like uh, Pete when I first met you, we're at the NC State game the day before, and we're at we're at Tots and we're hanging out, and Bruce Taylor is there and is just chilling with everybody. He's taking pictures, he's doing, and I, you know, that may not have happened six seven years ago. I will tell one very quick funny story from Spring Jam because you reminded me. Bruce Taylor walks into Spring Jam. I recognize him. Uh, we had met him that night, and so I was like, "Hey, Bruce, good to see you again." Uh, you know, your former player, like you're welcome to come in, enjoy yourself, like no charge, whatever. And he's like, how about this guy? Can this guy get in? He was the kicker. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good one. It's just scrawny looking white guy. Um, you know, I'm taller than me, but I'm not a tall man, but skinny. And I'm like, good one, Bruce. Just, just keep moving. Uh, you, you, and you pay the, pay the price. They come over with their tickets. I scan them. It's Chris Hazley. Cause I see his name <laughs> pop up. I was like, you were the kicker. I'm sorry, buddy. And it was, but I kind of knew him through an old uh, friend of mine who was in, in his frat. So like we had a good laugh about it. Um, and he considered it a donation to the sons of Saturday. So <laughs> there you go. But I, I shook Chris Hazley down for a ticket. So what can you do? Uh, Bull and bones. Sam and I are going to talk a little bit about the beer that mm-hmm. Sunday Saturday brewed with Bull and Bones, but we were, we spent a lot of time there. You and your parents had dinner there, Sam, and we were h- hanging out in there before Spring Jam, and so that relationship is just getting started with the beer. But that was a lot of fun being over there. And then before the game, I went up on Chicken Hill, mm-hmm. like early in the day. Saw Don V, Stephen Wright, uh, Dan was up there, Brian Siegler was up there, and then a, a lot of us made our way over to do the pregame show at Tots, which was fun. I put together kind of a mashup of that last night with some improved audio and put it on the YouTube channel. So look for that. It is definitely worth a listen for a hokey pharmacist alone, but, uh, <laughs> but Sam's content, Brian Siegel chugging a rail, uh, Billy Ray being hung over. Like it was, it, it was pretty great. So I would check that out on the YouTube channel, but that's about all I had from the, from the weekend before we get to the game and some other stuff here, Sam, did you have any, any thoughts on it? It's, slowly becoming one of my favorite weekends Mm -hmm. of the year is spring game weekend. I think Virginia tech has done a phenomenal job, especially compared to other schools of making spring game weekend, a big deal, not because the game is that incredible, but because everyone's kind of coming back to town. And so it's, it's one of my favorite weekends. I'm looking forward to next year already. I know we have a whole football season before that, but, uh, dude, it's just a great time. Like, mark it on your calendar for next year. It'll be roughly the same weekend. M- make your way to Blacksburg. Oh, I did also want to mention that Southwest VA Shop, SWVA Shop, who makes our merch, was also their pop up shop at Spring Jam, selling their stuff at Sweet Magnolia and whatever. So I'm going to pop their hat on just as a little, you know, thank you for them to showing up and selling all those Masters hats. Mike, they sold out of those things. Like, oh, man. It, 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 like I know you were you were hunting one. Um, I'm sure they'll get it back. And that Sam's holding up the Blacksburg Bombers sweatshirt that they made. Blacksburg Bombers up 3-0 on Radford right now. Excellent. Support the brand, Blacksburg Bombers. <laughs> but uh, 
I like this hat because they make the Richardson low profiles, which I, sometimes the hats are just so big. Uh, love the traditional Southwest VA logo and hat. So shout out to them too. Women's basketball. Quick a couple updates before we get to the spring game. They're retiring the 33. I know it's something that the Suns had tweeted about when they put the video up at the spring game. The Suns tweet was on the video. So that was really cool. And then WNBA draft was last night. And Liz Kitley was was having an Aaron Rodgers moment there for a little bit. And it was making me very sad because there's no way she sticks around to pick 24 where she was taken by Las Vegas if it's not for this knee injury. Is that your thought on it, Sam? Yeah, I mean, from what I know, too, about the WNBA, which is admittedly little, um, they have more talented, they have more professional level players than they do professional level roster spots by mm. a good amount. And so not even, not all the players who got drafted are even going to make the roster in their first year. Mm -hmm. However, with Kitley and the contract she signed, she's guaranteed to be there at least two years. So the first year is, is her rehab year. Um, you know, she was coming back from that ACL and then the next year she'll, will be her, her rookie season, uh, her Ben Simmons esque rookie season. <laughs> right. So, right. Right. Uh, and if you don't know about the NBA, it is uh, the Las Vegas aces are the best by a mile. They're the best organization. They have the best team. They have the best players. Uh, Asia Wilson, Candace Parker, a bunch of other stars. They had a sweet draft. They got the point guard from Syracuse, um, the other three point shooter from Iowa. I forget. Her they name. had so but, many picks. Like they really cleaned they had up a ton of picks. Yeah. How does uh, the best team get so many draft picks? Yeah. yeah that's Angel, what I'm wondering. <laughs> Angel Jackson from Jackson state, who I believe is the second HBCU player ever drafted in the WNBA. There's well, a little Mike, I guess you. it could be kind of like uh, OKC, right? Cause OKC is the yep. top seed in the NBA yeah. Western conference. And yet they have more picks than just about anyone in the NBA. Cause they're run well. You know, yeah. and I guess well-run organizations are uh, can do both. The men's team picked up a couple of commitments recently. We'll talk about their impact later in the show. Softball, I wanted to check today where they came in ranked because they were 16 last week, but they have won five in a row and Mercy ruled all five games, a combined score of 60 to seven. So the softball team is kicking butt 14 and four in ACC play. My The people I stayed with, my friends Karen and Ron, they put me up. Shout out to Karen and Ron. They went to all three softball games this weekend. They are huge softball fans. They take their girls. Um, and so I wanted to – dedicated Hokie fans, they needed a shout out. And thank you for letting me crash in your basement. Baseball <laughs> is number 23 as of – which I'm actually surprised they're still number – they're still ranked, right? Because they're ranked this week. But they lost the GT series, including a 19 to nothing thumping. And they got swept by Wake Forest before that. Sam, give us a little baseball update. Um, not a good two weekends. Wake Forest is a top five team in the country. They, they were playing poorly. They turned it on against Tech. It happens. Um, they they were competitive in all three of those games. They, they really were. Um, uh, ball strike call goes one way. Ball drops in the gap for Tech. And they might take one of those games, right? The Georgia Tech series was... I mean, they won 11 to one on Friday, played really well. Brett Renfro was amazing. And then Saturday it's, they I think they had like 19 walks in that game. Oh my like God. They just couldn't find the strike zone. And then on Sunday, they up seven, nothing in the sixth inning feeling great. And the bullpen just imploded. Uh, Georgia Completely Tech scores flat. 11, scores 11 runs. Georgia Tech's a, a, deep, a good team, especially offensively, but they just kind of collapsed again. So the, the story for Virginia Tech against Georgia Tech was the pitching just wasn't there, especially just in terms of command. But, you know, they're, they're playing pretty well right now against Radford, and they'll figure it out. The series at home against Duke is the series. They That's need to win one. that series. Yeah. I, I, they don't they – They're don't top 10, to right? It. Duke is top 10. Yeah, Duke is very good. But Tech can beat Duke. Tech can okay. beat Duke. So this series, and then they play at Chapel Hill – the next weekend, I think you got to go four and two in those six games. Yeah, got it. Thank you for that, Sam. I think that just about covers all the stuff. Now we can actually get to the stuff I know people want to hear about, which is the spring football game with Cole Chalmers. If you're watching on YouTube, give us a like before we get into this content. That would be appreciated. I did want to start with Mike just telling us a little bit about his coaching career, just to vet yourself to the listeners mike like how did you get started how long you've been doing it that kind of thing in, in, a, in a few sentences here so uh 
I, I spent over a decade uh, as a high school football, baseball. Uh, I coached wrestling for a few years. I, I've done I've done kind of a, a little bit of everything, but I spent six seasons as a head coach in uh, four in North Carolina, and then uh, and then two uh, in in Colorado. Uh, it's a I, I mainly focus on the offensive side of the ball. So you'll notice that in my analysis, you know, and, and I'll, I'll kind of dive into that a little bit when we start talking about the defense. I really focus on the offense. Um, it, it's what most people follow when they watch the ball game, uh, when they watch True. games uh, that people follow the ball and they're not really paying attention to what technique the D line's playing in or, you know, where the linebackers are lined up unless you're, unless you're a Virginia tech fan, then you know where every linebacker is at every time. <laughs> uh, but our, but yeah, that's a, so that's my background. Uh, you know, I was offensive coordinator uh, at a at, uh, 4A level, 3A level in North Carolina. I was in Winston-Salem. I was outside of Winston-Salem. I was in Charlotte uh, for, for an area for a little bit of time. And so I kind of bounced around, uh, bounced around the state and then offensive coordinator in Colorado Springs at a school, a 4A school there, and then head coach at a 5A school in Colorado. And I had stepped away a couple of years ago. Um, left teaching and so had a career change and this has been so great with the Sons of Saturday being a, uh, and you guys being able to stay involved in the game and you'll notice you'll see my hands pop up all over that's the place, fine but <laughs> I, I use my hands when I talk so <laughs> thank you YouTube you'll be able to see, you'll be able to see all that official position is football film analyst for Sons of Saturday put that on the resume Mike <laughs> yeah 100 percent yeah, so this is this is the uh, compared to me and Sam, we got an expert on our hands here. So this is going to be great tonight. The game was twenty-one to seven maroon at the half, and just if you didn't know, they split the teams up orange and maroon instead of maroon and white or orange and white or whatever. We had the color war, so that was kind of fun to watch. But that lead was built on the backs of drones and PJ Prelu really making some nice plays. The game ended 21 to 14. The second half, there wasn't a lot of scoring, obviously, but still things to observe. Big picture, Sam. You watch the game. It's over. What is your story of that spring game? Who or what was the story? Who? Uh, what was the what was the story in terms of things that we can take into 2024 or what was the story of the game? Just the story of th that individual game in its own right. Uh, tech is a tech is a really talented team because they looked really good and you didn't see a lot of starters play a lot. Um, I think the speed and size is in, greatly improved. I think for me, that's, that's the key. And then I also think, that's like point one A. Point one B is they seem fully bought in and the vibes are really high. Guys yeah. were jumping up and down. Dorian Strong was doing full on cheerleading routines on the <laughs> sidelines for the orange team. Like I think he was actually on the field during play while he was supposed to be on the sidelines at some point. So that was great to see from a, a senior leader. So these guys Mike, are bought would, in. They're big yeah. and fast. I love it. Mike, what would you say the story of the game was? We look complete as a team. Uh, there are so many spots where you can look at a spring game. You can go look at, you know, NC State, who they just – they tweaked their format or whatever, and they <laughs> yeah. just lit it up to make – you know, to hit the Sports Center top ten highlights. you got Alabama, who will not even play their starters, and they use it kind of as a, a spring evaluation period for a lot of their guys – we looked a as complete of a unit from on the sidelines, from a communication aspect, from coaches communicating in a split environment. Uh, I believe Chris Marv talked about it too when they had their in-game uh, look in. He talked about how the communication was really good between the defenders, and that's hard to do in a spring game. I think we, if I had to sum it up in a word, it would be complete. Uh, we looked com we looked whole. Yeah. Uh, it, where, whereas in the past, offense may have looked okay, and def defense is always ahead of offense when you're in the spring. And the defense looked okay, and at least we didn't have ten guys out there like Florida did in their spring game on special teams. We, you know, we were able to to do the little things right. And I know Coach Pride talks about all that uh, all the time with the 100 level stuff, making sure that we're mastering that in the spring in phase two. I think we did a really good job of, of putting all of that on display uh, on Saturday. Neither of you said what I thought you might say, which was PJ Prelu. 
That that was the story of the game oh, I got, right I there. I got plenty to say about him. <laughs> okay. You mean, I won't, you mean I won't Christian McCaffrey 2.0? Yeah, right. Uh, he was looking like Bryce Love out there, like body type, shiftiness, oh, yeah. whatever. We'll talk about him in a second. But I would say piggybacking on what Sam and what you just said is the depth. Like it looks like we have depth at a variety of positions where there hasn't been depth before. And so that is, that's very encouraging. Let's start, Mike, let's go to tempo. It's something you talked about. What did you think about the tempo of the offense, the play design? Because some of that stuff I feel like was what we were doing last year and will translate into this upcoming year. Again, like you don't want to show everything in the spring game. And we ran a lot of simple passing concepts, rolling the quarterback out, moving the protection, shifting it to one side uh, or the other, making it easy for, for drones. But as with regards to the tempo, the new communication rules that are in play for the NCAA this year, you could tell right away how quickly drones was taking to that. Uh, they were using hand signals, I believe, for the wide receivers and for the ancillary players, but Drones was getting the calls, relaying them to the line quick, and they were snapping the ball uh, that first couple of series within 15 seconds. So it, was a, it keeps the defense on their heels. You know, I don't think we will huddle this year except out of a timeout. Okay. I, I just – that's the way it, that's the way it looked in the spring game, and I know that they've – if they're doing it in the spring game, that means that's all they've been practicing. For the, yeah. for, the la- for the last 15 practices. So it looked really, really good. Even, you know, Pop Watson, it kind of, you could tell him and Dylan Wickey, you know, they were having trouble hearing at times because it was loud. Uh, you know, on, even on TV, it was loud in the spring game. Uh, you know, so they're having to cover their ears and you can kind of listen to them getting the call. I think it's going to be, it's going to be great for that continuity of call. That means that every single call, you're not going to have guys on the sidelines Pop Watson is going to have a headset in. He'll be able to hear exactly what's being called or Dylan Wickey, whoever's number two. It, it's, it's really going to speed things up and make things more efficient, keep the defense on their heels. And what did you think about in terms of the play design, like the schemes that they were doing? Like that's, that's what you're talking about, like a mix of the gap and the zone schemes. Do you think that will like, we saw some of that last year, obviously. Uh, and it seemed to be executed pretty well in terms of how, both quarterbacks were doing it a, a little bit less so from pop, but it looked, it looked smooth at, at times. Yeah. The, so the zone, the difference between a zone scheme and a gap scheme, for those of you who don't know, and I'm going to use my Frank Beamer hands. So make sure I get in front of my camera. <laughs> so in a, in a zone scheme, everybody's moving in the same direction. And what we did a lot of, and we ran some play action off of that. The first two drones touchdown passes were off of, play action off of that split zone look so you had every all the linemen moving in a zone to one direction and you have an h back or a or a wing back or a tight end offset that comes back against the grain to kick out that defensive end that's left alone and that split zone look the regular zone run look a gap scheme is where you're blocking back against the grain and you have a lineman or a single or a double lineman pull play side so, so you're, gap, you're blocking a gap down versus stepping to the side of the play. So, uh, so we were doing a good job of mixing that. I will say the, the first prelo touchdown was Montavious Cunningham pulling on a trap, kicking out, that, kicking out that end, and it opened up a massive hole. To run. I'm 43 years old. I could run through that hole. It was, it was, it was massive. Um, but the, but the both drones touchdowns, we're play action off of that split zone look. And it and what it does is that isolates single defenders in the flat and it isolates defenders in the secondary. So you have a flat defender, usually it's a corner, sometimes it's a drop linebacker that's sitting out there. If you have one guy and it's a levels concept. So you got a guy short, you got a guy mid, you got a guy deep. And and it just makes puts those guys on an island. So drones was able to uh, make the play fake, roll out. And he was able to basically have one read. As soon as that guy stepped up, he was able to hit the secondary level. If the secondary comes up and takes away the bottom two, you got the deep guy. It's it's a it's a really simple play design. We it's a waggle. Um, it's a it's a waggle concept. If you have ever played Madden, but I'm, a, I'm <laughs> yep. an old wing, I'm an old wing T guy. We used waggle. That was my number one pass play because it's really hard 
even at ba- even at really good defenses to cover all three levels of the field on half of a field that's shrunken down. Yeah. Uh, so they did a really good job of at mirroring that in. I noticed on the the big PJ Prelu reception, I believe it was this touchdown reception where they did that kind of waggle you, and then you have the running back come out and it puts him one on one with a linebacker. He actually got one on one with Gabe Williams, a true freshman who came this spring. Gabe Williams, really athletic guy, but like he doesn't have a shot right there to cover a running back one on one. You don't know if he's going to keep going straight, go inside, whether he's going to curl around, or you also have to worry about drones rolling out because there was no one in front of drones. And he just prelude just cooked them. And he yeah, and, and that's and that's the great thing about it, especially if you have a mobile quarterback that can go out there and run. You have a you have a guy that's going out running back that's going out in the flats, but that linebacker also has to be careful for that for that uh, to keep his eyes in the backfield and be looking for that quarterback run. And that, especially when you're a young guy, that's something that you really have to look out for. This is already great. I'm already loving this so much. Okay. So I want to get your guys' thoughts on QB play because Pop in particular was someone that a lot of people were talking about. Do you think he held the ball a little too long at times or was the fact that like you only have to tap him the reason that we had six sacks and, and all that pressure? Your take on Pop's performance, Mike? I think he looked like a redshirt freshman. Um, there is a his decision-making for him and Whitkey is just a half step slow. So the, so the sacks that, that happened in the game where he, it looks like they were just kind of holding on to the ball. I would have, I know, I know again, they don't want to show everything. I really wish they would kind of have rolled him out of the pocket a little bit more instead of having them just stand back there. But I think it was good to see which wide receivers could get separation on those intermediate routes uh, to see how the line is going to block in that five-step or uh, or three-step game that we have out of the shotgun, show the different protections that we're going to use. Sometimes we sometimes we slid the whole line. Sometimes we did a half slide, and then kept man on the backside with a running back. So I don't think you can really take much from what he showed, other than the more reps he gets, the the internal clock in his head will start clicking a little bit easier and they will use him like they use drones him and wiki's not as i don't believe as much of an athlete as pop is but i think you'll see him uh continue and move uh and, and progress as the season goes on yeah, what were your I, thoughts on pops yeah he did look like a redshirt freshman and he kind of looked how you expected him to look i i don't think he played great I think there are some definite issues size wise. Uh, they had to roll out the pocket. The, they had to roll out the pass protection for every pass play because yeah, he was on the, the one, move a decent amount. The one that they didn't was tipped at the line for an interception. And, I, uh, and was that Burgos who? Yeah, it was Burgos and then because he had Copeland. A, Burgos had Copeland picked day. it off. Yep, Copeland picked it off. Uh, we'll talk about the defensive line later, but I mean, I, I just. He had some decent receptions, but they were kind of a wide open. He had a wide open Jennings who had a big yards after catch, and then Jalen Lane juked Caleb Woodson out of his socks and had a big game. Uh, oh, and then he immediately, step. and the then he immediately got taken out. There's your highlight. <laughs> Get out of here, man. Um, you know, I, I think he he's definitely has an arm on him, and he's definitely an athlete. I just wonder if he'll be able to grow into an ACC quarterback, not only with his size, but also is he good enough throwing and running to, to be able to overtake, you know, uh, Davi Belfort or Keldon Ryan or whoever else comes in. I know uh, Brent, Brent Price said after the game that one of the areas that they will be looking in the spring transfer portal would be a veteran backup quarterback. Now he might want a veteran backup quarterback. Well, I want a Porsche Cayenne and a vacation to Tahiti. We don't all get what we want. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where he's going to find that veteran backup quarterback, yeah. but uh, I, I think there's room to grow, but the raw tools are definitely there, man. They're definitely. Oh, and that's, there. that's yeah. what I was going to say is that it, I, I completely understand what you're saying, Sam. And I, I think a lot of people had similar observations. I just think you could still see the raw talent and how good he could potentially be. And whether those guys were open for passes or not, I thought he put some some passes on the money, and he was dealing with a lot of pressure. That maroon yeah. D line was was coming in after him, 
and he looked thicker, just a little bit thicker than last year. He was very slight before. So I think, I do think there was some size put on and like drones in last year's spring game where you can't really emphasize his talents in a spring game, his ability to run, his ability to be elusive. Like there were so many times where pop got sacked and it's like a tap on his shoulder. Like he wouldn't have gone down a couple of them. He would have been killed. They but, almost uh, gave him that touchdown. <laughs> right. They almost took away the touchdown, but that would have been a touchdown in a real game because he would have been able to break the tackle and get in. Uh, and so I actually was pleased with pop. And I think if we had mm-hmm. to rely on him against Boston college Pitt, I don't know. I think he could get it done. I think he could play well enough to get it done because look at our offense where he's surrounded by talent. Like if you like, that's a favorable position to put any backup quarterback in. You know, he might be able, and he's a great athlete. I don't want to demean him to game manager, quarterback, or anything, but no. if you needed to, hey, we'll run a few read options with you. We'll get you out of the pocket, hand the ball off to Tootin and hand it off to Malachi, get the ball out of your hands, man. Like they can definitely win playing that game. Okay. Let's talk about running back and PJ Prelu here. He was shifty. He followed his blocks pretty well, at least in my opinion. 91 total yards in the game. That's a lot for a spring game for a running back. 62 rush yards. A 31-yard rush TD, which looked really nice, and then the 22-yard TD catch. He he did it all, and he made Childress look silly on that one run. And uh, Mike, you said you had a lot to say about PJ Prelu. Were you impressed? Did this like blow, knock your socks off, or what? Yeah, there there was so much good that he did, and you could kind of tell that he almost felt like he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. One because he's a legacy. Right. His dad's on staff. His dad played there. He's a Mm -hmm. Hokie legend. So his I can tell you could kind of tell that he was really, really wanting to wanting to show out. And that running back room is legit stacked. You know, Mm -hmm. it seems that way. Play a snap. Right. He played like two snaps. He never touched the ball. Yeah. 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 He never touched the ball. Which was great. Get him out of the game. Get him out of the game. Let him dress out. Get him out of the game. Uh but Malachi Thomas looked really good. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeremiah Coney looked good. You know, we did, and with Prelo, Prelo had pretty much elevated himself. He's going to be that third option. But the thing I liked hearing Pry talk about when they when they did the uh, they did the interview section, he mentioned that they also got him playing some slot back. So he's going to be involved in the passing game. He's going to be a little more Christian McCaffrey esque not comparing him to Christian McCaffrey. It was one spring game. <laughs> but he's going to be that guy that you could flex out into the slot and move him around and, and be a weapon in the passing game where you're going to have not even a nickel back. You're going to have an outside linebacker or a safety on him that's not going to be able to hang. Yeah, I mean, we talked about in the pregame show that today was somewhat of a tryout for 2025 for a lot of guys. And I think P.J. Praler and Jeremiah Coney are – they're ready to step into that Tootin and, and by uh, Tootin and Malachi Thomas role next year. Yeah, and I mean, don't I forget think... about Tyler Mason. He right, really good in limited action for mm-hmm. being for having been on campus for three months. Right, it's and he bear... set all those records in high school. Like I've Crazy. been excited about Mason, but it's like now I'm excited about three guys below yeah. the guys we already know can play. Well, this offense Mason... is tailor made for running backs. It oh. is it is designed for Saquon Barkley esque players not Saquon Barkley again we're not going to say that but (laughs) you can tell it's designed around having one two maybe even three really good running backs I talked to some guys at one of my old schools uh after that game that may that Tyler Mason in high school last year set the North Carolina record for six rushing touchdowns and a half (laughs) <laughs> against yeah. the, one of the he didn't school, play second schools. halves of a lot of games right like no, he didn't play fourth quarters or second North, halves. North Carolina has a 40 point blowout rule so if you're up by 40 you don't you you know it's a running clock so but there but he said he said that guy is every bit as legit as he looks he said it didn't ma- doesn't matter that he played at a 1a school and and Mount Airy plays some of the best best 1a teams in the state because they are always contending for the state championship it didn't. It doesn't matter. He is in. He he would have succeeded at a four A school. He would have. He would have done. He would have done just as well. Uh, so really excited about what he's got coming in the future. When we were talking on our pregame show, uh, I had a, a Grant Wells Award for someone who has a standout performance, but maybe doesn't follow it up in the regular season. Uh, it could be because of actual like how good they really are. But I had said it was Jeremiah Coney because 
there's just not enough snaps to go around. I didn't think PJ Prelude would have this performance, but Coney lived up to me to the, having a standout performance, 87 total yards. And <laughs> we'll, we're going to talk about the defense in a, in a few minutes here, but like all these rushing yards is making me from not our top backs is making me just a little concerned about another one of our positions, but let's talk about offensive line. Cause you mentioned Montavious Cunningham and on the long play to Malachi, the longest play of the day, the more brother brothers were out running in front of that screen and mm-hmm. Cunningham. I think he made that first block to kind of open things up. Do you think he's going to end up being a starter at right guard? I think he's, he's, and I, y'all clowned on me early. Yeah. When you get, when you guys had French on in the, uh, I talked the, to French about this too. Yes. No, I don't it, think we clowned on you. You said, <laughs> is he a guard or a tackle? You thought guard French thought tackle. And it looks like you might be right. So I, I just, I, I'm looking at, I'm looking completely at just his size and and i'm looking at it from a perspective of when i used to build my offensive lines i wanted to build them from the inside out uh, a lot of teams want some some teams would like to build them starting with your tackles i'm putting my best lineman at tackle and then i'm just i'm filling in towards the middle i want my best three guys to be my two guards in my center because that's they're the guys that are going to pull the most they're the guys that are doing most of the communication I think that Cunningham being there, he has tackle level feet, guard body, which is going to be. I mean, you saw him pull and kick out on the prelo run. He got the he got to a cornerback on a screen on a running back screen. Like he track he can he can move. He's a, he's a he's a large large athlete, and seeing him make those make that play. There's now granted we we do have some other stuff to worry about on the offensive line. But Cunningham is just a – I think he's got that – he's got that thing anchored down. You would rather him stay there than potentially move one spot to the right and take over for what could be an issue because we saw with our – with Burgos specifically kind of giving Parker Clements a hard time. Yes. Now, I will say – again, here comes Frank Beamer hand. <laughs> With that protection that we were running, we were we were calling slide protections. So usually you'll take the slide protection, you'll call it the center will call it or the quarterback will call it to the where wherever the shade technique is. So the guy that's lined up in the A gaps, if there's just one, they'll slide so that center can pick up that A gap because it's a hard reach to go in the other direction for that guard to get there. So normally when that happens, you're you got your splits, you're set up already defensive lines can adjust but if you have a slide called parker clements who was at right tackle he couldn't let that inside gap go he could not he could not step out like he probably needed to to get burgos because his responsibility is going to be that left side gap so having that there and 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 when he go when he when he slides and then he gets into his drop now burgos was set up at a wide nine technique so he's not even lined up on the outside of the tight end. He's wider than that. He's way out there, yeah. He's way out there. That's technically supposed to be the responsibility of the running back to pick that up in a slide. So the so the running back is supposed to come over and slide over and pick up that and pick up that, which is a big ask for running back to go pick up Burgos. But a lot of times in our passing game, we're three steps and the ball's gone. So we're we're three steps, we're making our pre snap read, ball's gone. The, all the running back has to do really is chip. And so uh, go go back and, and rewatch on some of those sacks. It looked like Clements was – they were all shifting to the left, to one side, and there was just nobody there, and the running back was just late to get over. Um, that's just a design. You can, you can adjust that later. You can shift the back over, and you'll notice that uh, every once in a while you'll see the quarterback kind of wave the running back around his back to the other side. Mm-hmm. That's what they're doing. They're calling the shift so the running back can go across the formation and pick up and pick up that defensive end. I could be completely wrong. I don't know the ins and outs. There's <laughs> no, I mean, listen, I, that, I think that's some I good perspective because a lot of times in football as fans, you watch something and your eyes see this blame goes here, but sometimes the call is bad. Someone missed an assignment. And so that is good perspective. Sam, did you want to get in here on the offensive line at all? Or yeah, I, I, I think they're much better run blocking than they are pass blocking. I think it's just the nature of the players they have right now. Uh, and I think you can tell with how they run pass pro, but also they're really good run blocking. And 
I think they're really, really good in the screen game. Uh, that screen to Malachi Thomas was perfection. Yeah, and Caden Moore. He didn't even Kaden have Moore, anyone to block. He's just like no, running. He was running step for step with Malachi Thomas for about 40 yards and then started to slow down a little bit. Like, it was a great Jason Kelsey impression. <laughs> it really was. And I tell you, the only, I mean, Christian Darisol, I think is the last tech lineman that I saw kind of have that feet on the outside. Wyatt Teller kind of developed that in the NFL, I think a little bit more, but I think they have a good offensive lineman. And I think they're going to grade out at the end of the year very well. However, the players that they do have on offensive line right now, to me, they have a tendency to have those uh oh moments. And like we saw it in the Florida State game a little bit, where it was just immediate pressure on drones, like not a shot. Yep. It was too much. And I think there's there's a step up that they need to take that I don't think at least from what I saw in the spring game against a very, very good defensive line who I said was top three. I think they're going to be top two in in the ACC. They had that, they had those moments. Um, Yeah. So I, I think they'll get better. However, Virginia tech did offer Andrew Chambly uh, all freshman sec tackle from Arkansas. Yeah, That would be nice. Huh? That would be nice if we could get that guy. I'm not saying that we can't improve either. Like no, we, we improved we last we year. Yeah, but... in, I'm not saying that we can't go into the portal and improve, you know, but it, I, I think if, if we, for some reason, we're stuck with the guys that we got, you know, take the girl that brought you to the dance, you know, or dance with the girl mm-hmm. that brought you, you know, whatever, whatever that expression is, you are, you are going to see, especially from uh, left tackle, left guard, center, right guard, it's going to be very solid. They, they're not going to be world beaters. I think we're going to be good enough, especially now that we're running more of an outside zone scheme and we're, and we're kind of letting that, letting our athletic guys get out in front a little bit and let our running backs just see the cutback lanes and go, put their foot in the ground and go. I think you're going to see a lot of really good things uh, from them this year. Let's talk about receivers before we take a break. And I'm, when I say receivers, let's, let's encompass the tight ends because we saw Harrison had the TD on that play action fake you had kind of mentioned earlier to P- Prelude. And then Zeke had four catches in this game. Zeke Wimbush, the, the new guy. Um, and then Harrison St. Germain was out there. You know, I had some some guys out that we'll rely on as well with Gallo and, and Gosnell. But then you look at the receivers, and Jennings looks like his old self. Green looks like a player with four receptions. Heath had four receptions. Lane you talked about the jab step that he put on the move and he looked just like he did during the season. Looked great. Chance Fitzgerald had an awesome catch and 55 yards in the game. And then XTB who we've seen make plays in the regular season had a couple grabs as well. The depth of receiving options specifically at wide receiver, but also at tight end is just starting to make me giddy. Like it's because if anyone like chance was a guy I hadn't even heard much about, like I had heard about, a lot of the other guys, but chance, you know, he redshirted last year, whatever. He looked great. He, he was looked athletic and he made a play on a, on a, you know, a toughly thrown ball. And so I just, I just can't believe it. Like, I just can't believe yet another one of these wide receiver pickups might be a hit. Cause normally you have your misses, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to find a miss in that wide receiver room right now. It's an, it's an embarrassment of riches. It <laughs> yes, truly, yes, it is. truly is. They, and you didn't even mention, you know, Brody Adams. Who's right, probably, he didn't play. He, he's who's gonna who's probably gonna get some run at some point. Uh, I would love it if he redshirted. In this day and age, though, it's probably not gonna happen. Let's have a conversation about that in one second. But keep going. Oh yeah. But so with the with the tight ends that we have, you're gonna have a couple of guys, uh, Gosnell, Saint Germain, and Gallo, primarily that are gonna be your guys that can do a little bit of both that can block on the edge and that can also get out there and help you in the pass game. Gosnell was a four-star guy. We took him from Ohio state. You know, I've, I've coached against him and his brother, Steven. They were, they were at East Surrey high school uh, in pilot mountain, North Carolina. They they're again, one, a products from the Northwest one, a conference. They are, they are dudes, both of them. They, and we didn't even mention Gosnell. Gosnell will be back. And you talk talk about yeah. I was talking talk mainly about, about the guys receiver. who played, but you're right. Oh, yeah. I mean, 
We Chance Wiggins. That's how play. many there are, Pete. Bro, Brody Adams didn't play. <laughs> Gus Nell's hurt right now. So uh, Tucker Holloway has has a little bit nicked up. So yeah, it's ridiculous. It is absolutely mm-hmm. ridiculous. And and you meant and you mentioned before with the running backs in the screen game. Don't forget about those wide receivers that played with the with their screen game uh, with with Turner Bradshaw with to Kay Heath. We and, ran and the we, end around with uh, Tucker in the UVA game. And like, yeah, it, it, we have all those guys that can, can move around and get East and West. And that just puts your defense in such a bind. Let's that Fredshirt thing. Someone asked me this at the bar. I think it was Stephen Wright. And he said, Pete, we got, you know, these four stud wide receivers from last year. We got new guys coming up. We got some guys like XTB who made a little bit of a name for themselves how we have to redshirt the younger guys, right? Like, wouldn't that be optimal to redshirt a Brody Adams or a Chance Wiggins? And I was like, there's no way you can redshirt Brody Adams. Like, you, he was a top 10 player in Virginia. He comes here expecting to play. He knew what he was getting into, without a doubt. Uh, his father said as much when he was on Boundary Corner. But the other, the real counterpoint to the redshirt idea is that if Brody Adams is as good as we think he can be, he's not staying past three years anyway. So the yeah. redshirt really don't matter because he's either he's going to be off to the NFL in three years after two good years after his redshirt, or he beats someone out this year, or he transfers to another school because guys don't stay in school four or five years at the same yeah. school. Like if, if you know what I'm saying. So like redshirting for non linemen. I just don't really see it as a thing anymore. Like, especially yeah. at the first school, maybe once you get to the second school, you want to extend your, your stay. But uh, I don't know. I don't see him getting a red shirt would be my thought on it. To no, me, I don't, red, I don't, oh, sorry, yeah. Same. No, it's, it's to me, red shirting is, has become more of a defensive front seven offensive line thing, maybe quarterback thing. Yeah. Maybe um, quarterback. If you have a guy who just really loves the school and knows they want to be there. Um, it's not really a skill position thing anymore uh, for better or worse, but I just, I just jotted down to help mentally compartmentalize these guys, like our, our starting four wide receivers and then their backups. So yeah, like Jennings Lane, Gosnell Felton for the starters, they're all gone after this year, no matter what, like yeah. they're gone uh, behind them. You have green behind Jennings, Fitzgerald behind Felton Adams behind Gosnell Wiggins behind lane. They immediately slide in to the same positions. Like, you have your your two slot and then your two outside wide receivers to simplify it that have to play next year because yeah. we lose our four guys. They're out of eligibility. So yeah. that's kind of the selling point, I think, to these guys and why they're sticking around. Aiden Green uh, gives me Cam Phillips career vibes. Okay. Not the first two years, not the number one guy, kind of sitting behind some stars. By the end of his career, he's going to put up some numbies. <laughs> and I think he knows that. I think the team knows that. And I think who they just bring on to the staff, former player, who was it? Within the it last was, month? Yeah. Oh, it was Cam Phillips that yeah. they brought on. Oh, to the oh, staff. oh. <laughs> you, you knew the answer. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, they, they know what they're doing in the wide receiver room right now. Cam Phillips was out on Friday night. Mm-hmm. Saw him too. Uh, was, in terms of Aiden spiffy. Green and Cam Phillips comparison, Aiden Green, much bigger. he's a much larger person but uh all right let's take a quick uh commercial break beer break and then we'll come back and and talk about some defense and the hokies under the influence podcast is brought to you by roback roback is the only performance active wear that's designed for those who crave activity that's right and the commonwealth which is the beautiful polo sam's got his his hoodie on right now super comfortable go ahead do you, you keep going with the athlete. Okay. I'll be right back. The Commonwealth is the white polo with the maroon Virginias. And if you're down in Blacksburg for any given game, you will see approximately 400 of them because everyone's got them. But that doesn't matter. You need one too. You want to be a part of the cool club. You can head over to Roback.com, load up your cart, 2 deep VT. There it is. 2 deep VT to get your hands on that sweet polo. It's 2 DVT, 20% off your order. They've got the quarter zips, which they have the Berg as well, which I saw the, some of those this weekend too. Uh, joggers, shorts, tennis skirts, and the hoodie that Sam is modeling. I already said this, but load up that cart, 2 DVT, 20% off. Roback, Crave Activity. 
for right now, Sam, I need to know what you're drinking. And I also need to get final thoughts on the Shandy that we tried. And, um, and Mike, we're going to ask you next. Are you drinking anything over there, Mike? Oh yeah. All right. This is a ahead, super, Sam. this is a super beta move right now for me. I'm not drinking <laughs> beer again on this show. However, I do promise I'm going to a six pack store in downtown Suffolk. Going to get some fun, quirky beers. It's going to be great. I'm on a juice cleanse. So right now we have chocolate cashew, uh, <laughs> Cashews, dates, pumpkin seeds, cacao, and vanilla. Um, if I can think free. of anyone that needs to go on a juice cleanse less than Sam, I, I can't come up with it. This is, <laughs> this is why we're here. Like, this is why we're at where we're at because we make these sacrifices. I got to tell you, though, <laughs> this is absolutely delicious. It's like a chocolate milk smoothie. Um, I'm a big cashew fan, so I'm okay with what you're yeah. drinking. That, that's so, fine, uh, man. But from now, no one yell at me. I know it's a partially a beer podcast. But you had your beer on Saturday. But I had plenty of beers on Saturday. Uh, I think it is a really, really good beer. A shandy. Yes. And you have to understand, like, a shandy is a very un-beer type beer. If you haven't had one yet, they're not as popular as some other styles of beers. And love them. This is a beer that's, like, meant to be drank ice, ice cold. So when you have it, make sure it is ice, ice cold. Oh, I got some news going on to, that front too. It is going to go down so easy. It is the slightly lemony, slightly citrus. It's not as aggressive as some other shandies like a Leinen Kugel, uh, but it's crisp. It's fresh. It is very drinkable. You're not going to feel heavy. It's a great, great spring and summer beer. You know, if you're in Blacksburg, you got to go grab some. Yes, I would agree with everything you said. When it's hot outside. Shandies are fantastic. I we talked about Line and Kugel when we did our video, but like the Porch Rocker is always a good one. Any Rattlers from my local place, I really enjoy. And the thing I heard in re- reference to the being cold, Sam, is that Bull and Bones is in the process of fully revamping their cooling and tap system. So when you go in there this fall, you are going to get ice cold, fresh Saturday Shandy. So I, that's something I just heard about today. So that is, uh, that's exciting. Uh, Mike, what are you drinking over there? Uh, I am in uh, on a work trip in Salt Lake City, Utah uh, this week. Uh, so I have a Squatters Juicy IPA from Squatters Brewery in Salt Lake City. Uh, very good. Uh, kind of a, a, you have, in order to get anything in Utah that's above 5%, it has to be in a can. Uh, so <laughs> it's just the, just the way things are. If you get a draft beer, it can't, it can't be more than 5%. So it's a, so it's a, it, it's a pretty good low ABV. I think it's a uh, six and a half percent. Um, but it, uh, really does use those, none of a Northeast style, New England style IPA. So it's got that, um, hazy color. Can't really see it cause it's in a can, uh, but really good fruity notes, kind of great fruity orangey flavor and uh, really, really delicious. Dude, what a pro review. Really love that. And you being out in <laughs> Utah, you were able to hang with Billy Ray. You had lunch with him uh, about a month ago, three weeks ago, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I got to uh, hang out uh, with uh, Billy Ray uh, one of my trips out here, and then I got to hang out with Pat during uh, during a different trip. Um, you know, I'm, I'm that, here that's usually, awesome. every, every, usually here every couple of weeks, but it's, uh, it's it was fun seeing the boys uh, out there in Park City. Heck yeah. I am drinking the Hazy Dawn. By Kate May Brewing Company. Kate May is about an hour from my house, and we go down there quite a bit. Been to the brewery, uh, but they sell this everywhere in South Jersey. It's probably, if not number one, the number two or number three brewery in the state. And Jersey makes a lot of good beer. But the Hazy Dawn is an 8% double with tropical waves of flavor is how it's described. And I would fully endorse this beer. I'm not always wanting to drink doubles, but on a night when I'm doing the pod and maybe I only want to have one beer or two beers, it's a perfect time to bust out an 8% hazy beer. So loving it. The hazy dawn by Kate may brewing defensive observations. Let's uh, let's, let's go back to the game here. And I want to flip over to the side of the ball that was having all those rush yards, you know, going against them. We didn't have Lawson out there. We didn't have Stroman out there. We didn't have APR. There was no Fuga. So we're missing some of our our main guys. And even with all those rush yards, the defense put up 13 total sacks in the game. Maybe not all of them would have been real game sacks, but nevertheless, 13. Four total fumbles forced. 
two were recovered by the defense and two interceptions by the defense. Burgos had that sweet pass breakup grabbed by Copeland that we mentioned. Burgos was kind of a menace in this one, right? Like three sacks for him. Mike, what did you see out of the D line that you were impressed by? Cause you had mentioned some of the coverages being wrong, but doesn't that also mean that the defense was doing something to confuse them? Yes. I, the, Defensive line, again, you're, they're, we're not going to show any games. We're not going to do any stunts. We're not going to really put a whole lot of blitz packages in in the spring, at least put them on film so offenses can scout them. So one of the reasons that you saw a lot of rushing yards, uh, I believe, is because of that. We were kind of playing a vanilla base defense and just and just letting the, letting the ends go. And they did. <laughs> but Kamari Copeland is an absolute beast. He is going to be trouble for a lot of people uh, that we that we play. Uh, I I am not really. I know we'll probably get to linebackers here in a minute. I know it's probably a big point of emphasis. But as far as the defensive line goes, again, I wouldn't take too much from it, knowing the guys that we had out. I think they did very good. They made some plays in the backfield on the running backs occasionally. I think it's really good, especially because when you had a when you had a mixed group, you know, communication is always going to be difficult when you got a mixed group in there so the ones aren't all running together the twos aren't all running together consistently in practice so that's going to be a big that's going to be cured just by the season starting you're going to have all those guys out there together at one time and they're going to be used to communicating used to knowing what they're going to be able to do with each other sam did you have any commentary on the d line because i got some other guys that i'll let me do this i'm going to read off just a couple more commentary on the, the plays and stats and then i'll give you a chance to comment james Jeanette, a guy we haven't heard much about made a really nice t- ts tfl beating hsg i think that's where i was going with that <laughs> harrison saint germain three total tackles for loss for james Jeanette, a sack in a hurry that was someone that we didn't talk about at all last year was a juco guy quite frankly thought he might be on the chopping block and he comes out and he looked Great. Two sacks for Jason Abbey in a hurry. And then Hicks, two sacks and a hurry, probably towards the end of the game. But Sam, what did you think about the defensive line? Uh, they're monsters. They're absolute <laughs> monsters. A nice peoples is like, he's so fast and twitchy. And then you could just see the push and the speed that Kevin Gilliam was getting. What Burgos was getting. Like those guys are, menaces i i legitimately think this is the best I, they haven't played a snap together so i shouldn't say that but <laughs> this defensive line has potential to be the That's best defensive line we've seen in a since 06 07 times oh, are you going say, back that I, far I was, I was yeah I, yeah i mean oh, the only wow. one i could think about is when we had settle and ricky walker at d tackle that was like oh we got 16 dudes up there yeah yeah but they didn't have to depth that this team does no. and so i just think defensive line uh they are they are special i think defensive end rotation i think they might end up being a little thinner than people think at defensive end so i wouldn't be surprised james Jones is a guy who came in as a defensive end they moved him into like a d tackle d end hybrid I think after some injuries in the spring game, he might move out back to, to D end in a depth piece. Because yeah, he does I, look. That's he what was I was making thinking, plays. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about those linebackers that you mentioned. And and you gave a good explanation on the rushing numbers. However, if you look at some of the plays out there, it seemed as if the linebackers were going backwards. They, they seemed maybe a little confused at times. Uh, maybe not so much poor tackling. That is something that we saw during the regular season. I'm not sure that was what I'm so much worried about. It's more of like, I don't like to see your linebacker like backpedaling or completely being out of the play. Yeah. There's those, those linebackers had, again, I think a lot of it was too. I mean, we were playing Gabe Williams out there. Uh, quite a bit. Uh, you know, we had some y- really young guys in there, and it does take a minute. You know, you're going up against 300 pound offensive linemen. You know, it's kind of hard for some of those smaller freshman linebackers to not get put on skates. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna really, and, and a lot of times, athleticism in a run blitz type of look, 
you're going to you're going to see a lot more activity during the regular season from those guys where they're not in the way they, they may have been coached in this game to kind of play back at depth. You know, it just kind of re kind of read and react. I, I, I'm just thinking about how I in a scrimmage type situation that I would want my linebacker because I don't want them to get caught in the scrum, get rolled up on. Now we're down more depth. You know, there's a lot of it, there's a lot of other things at play. I think also too, just like with the defensive line and the secondary, defense is all about communication. It's all about knowing and trusting the guy next to you. You got two linebackers like they got a bar between them. So if they start scraping, you got one guy going to the A gap and the other guy is going going to the outside. You know, they're they're all moving in unison with one other when they're when they're reading and reacting. So I, I think. A lot of times, if you're not used to one guy playing next to you, if you've got a guy that's usually running with the ones or twos and you've got a guy that's a three or four next to him, there's a reason why he's three or four. You know, he and he's usually a half step slow, so that's going to provide you your gaps because one guy's going to be playing up and he's going to be reading and reacting properly and the other guy's going to be that half step slow. Like we said with Pop Watson earlier at the quarterback, that half step means a one or two yard gain versus a seven or eight and nine yard gain. Yeah, no, and that's that is that's well said, and everything you're saying makes a lot of sense. So let's just I want to ask you about Brumfield because he's the one that we've got a lot of we're pushing our chips in on him at, at Mike. You know, we they went out and got him, and we didn't really bring anyone else at the position, and it was a position that struggled last year. In the short spurts, how do you think he looked moving around and everything? I think his horizontal movement east and west is leaps and bounds above where we have been. I think that he, he, he made some plays. He ran, I think it was Turner Bradshaw. He tracked him down, uh, had the great angle on the sideline, and it was able to get him out of bounds uh, on an early play. Just movement east, his movement east and west, I think the more comfortable he gets in the system, I mean, he's only been there for three months. So right. as as more he, the more he gets a fill in that system, I think he's going to be just fine. I love the comparisons. Uh, that some of the coaches, when they were talking about him, what they were how the, what they were how they were talking about him. Chris Marv, you know, he was an All SEC performer at Vanderbilt, and he says, "Yeah, he's just like me, but he's bigger, stronger, and faster." You know, he, you know, he, he he really likes he really likes the way he fits in that system. I think he's going to be much better because of the way he's played against high caliber SEC talent in the past. He's going to be able to not be, even though he's going to be consistently playing against P five teams, he's seen it. He's been there, done that, got the T-shirt. So he's going to be able to see that. I think he's also going to be better in that Mike role of being able to drop back in coverage if need be. Uh, I would hope so, right? Being able to sink back. I think his athleticism is going to be, with his size, is going to be a lot better. Now, he's he's slightly undersized, you know, but he's got better feet. I think he's got better athletic ability. I think he's going to be just fine. Um, I would really like – to see more more film of him, to be honest with you, yeah. before make make the full assessment. But I also think the summer is going to be massive for him. As long as he can stay healthy over the summer, he gets rep, he gets work, and then when he when August starts rolling around, I think we're going to see he'll cement himself in that role. Okay, so we kind of we kind of went through everything here. Maybe maybe a little bit less on the DBs, but I thought I thought for the most part the DBs played pretty well. Um, yeah. We didn't have, you know, we don't have Strowman out there playing safety or anything. I wanted to kind of get the overall thoughts on just final observations from the game. And as we kind of transition here into the offseason and and into fall camp, like what did what was a takeaway? I asked you for a story game earlier, final takeaways from the game. And Sam, I'll ask you first. Yeah, I think my takeaways are we're a little bit better in the spots we thought we would be good at and probably still have issues at the spots we knew we would have issues. Like I think the offensive line is missing a piece wherever that piece is and however they need to shuffle it. And I mean, you just talked about linebackers. I thought there were times where you, I I put some in the Twitter chat, Pete, where you're watching some of those big runs and you look at one of the linebackers, you're like, man, where are you going? Like there was a play, a, a read option where Jeremiah Coney got a big run. Don't want to take away from, from Coney, but the, the middle linebacker who was had the quarterback on that play never moved. The ball's handed off. After the ball's handed off, he then goes and covers the quarterback. Like 
dude, dude, quarterback doesn't have the ball. You don't need to play that role anymore. <laughs> the ball is gone. I, I do think that linebacker room instincts feel to be growing, right? I, I think they still have a lot of guys who are changing positions in that room. And like you said, Pete can't use that excuse forever, but you do. <laughs> and I think at the offensive line, you have guys who are, some guys are going to be able to grow and take that step forward. Some guys aren't. Some guys are at the top of their potential. And I think over the summer and in fall camp, they're going to figure that out. Um, I do think we bring in an offensive tackle in the portal and then uh, a best available guy because tech is inevitably going to lose somebody um, and yeah. in, in a depth piece or something. Whether so, it's a linebacker or a safety, or you're just saying anywhere. Yeah. Somewhere yeah. best available guy, but overall, man, this is a, this is a darn good football team. Yeah. Like, Mike, what were your final takeaways? I think, I, I think before I said that we looked complete, um, I, I would say that the growth is obvious uh, from, from every perspective of the program, from how the coaching staff carried themselves to how the players were acting on the sideline to how we looked on the field. There was a, I'm not going to say swagger because that's a Miami thing, but <laughs> they looked confident. They looked like they knew what they were doing. They understood what their assignments were. Now, execution is a completely different thing. I, but I think everybody on the field, all 22 that were on the field, they looked like they understood what their role and what their responsibility was. And we were playing as a unit, not a collection of individuals. Where I think in the past it was, hey, I'm D-line. I'm going to go get mine. I'm going to eat versus I need to play my role as a part of one of 11 on defense and, let, and trust my teammates to go make plays. It didn't, it didn't always work. But I think that was a change that happened at the beginning, at the middle of the year last year that we've seen continue to grow. And I think that's just a testament to senior leadership. It's a testament to the culture that's being developed uh, throughout the entire program where, you know, it's not necessarily, even though it plays such a huge role, it's not necessarily all about who's getting a big paycheck, who's, who's got this deal, who's got X and Y, who's got the car, who's got whatever. It's more about this team has got to be successful if I want to get to where I got to get to. If my goal is to get to the show, this team has to do well, not and just me. Pry has seemed to preach that. And they have seemed to buy into that. And that is what is so great about this team and what all the messaging we get from the program and the team seem to incorporate that as well. I would say that before the game, I felt good about this team and I still feel very good about this team. Sam, you put out the thing. Do you feel better or worse after the game? I think I feel better about offense and I think I feel slightly better about defense as well. Let me check the results of that. I forgot okay. to write those down. My, my yeah, bad. And, and I know, stay with us. Yeah, because we had the concern, and me and Sam both have expressed it, the concern over linebacker. But I had that concern before the game. So say that's the same. I feel even better about the D-line. I feel even better about the wide receivers, which I was already ecstatic about. And with the way we run blocked in this game, I feel better about the offensive line too. And so yep. overall, I think the spring game is a win. I know Billy Ray always says you can't take too much from a spring game. I'm not taking too much, but if you're asking me if I feel better or worse, I'm saying I feel better. 84% better, 16% worse. Okay. And I'm going to guess All the right. people who said 16% worse, it's about the offensive line, pass protection. Yeah, could be. Could be. Yep. That's, now that's I have the point. final, yep. I have the final awards from spring practice. Uh, we, it's going to hit them on the top, but I figure we do them at the end. Most improved cornerback Mansoor Delane and wide receiver Aiden Green. If if Delane's winning most improved, that's a good sign. That is that's really nice because he was already a good player. MVP QB Chiron Drones, uh defensive tackle Aeneas Peebles and linebacker Jaden Keller for special teams was MVP. Leadership award defensive tackle Josh Fuga and center Caden Moore. You'd love to see that. The two guys in the middle of your lines win the leadership award and then ultimate teammate was cornerback Miles Ellis and running back PJ Prelude. So not only is he shifty and quick out on the field, but he's winning the ultimate teammate award. Mike, we've taken up too much of your time. Thank you so much for coming on with us, man. You really helped us break this down. We appreciate it. Hey, anytime, my pleasure. It's been uh, a real treat. Uh, thank you guys so much. And anytime you guys want to 
talk ball, just hit me up, let me know. Be careful what you wish for, because we're going to yeah. get you back on during the season for more sure. than once. There is no Absolutely. doubt about it. So we're we're pumped about that. We're going to let you go. We're going to do a little bit of basketball coverage, and then uh, we'll close this thing out. But, Mike, thanks again. Have a good rest of your night. Hey, cheers, thanks, guys. Mike. Later. Okay. Quickly, Sam, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but I did want to, yeah. I said, we talk about the men's basketball commitments because we didn't get to the last two that we've had. We've added Ben Burnham from college of Charleston, a six, seven, 220 pound small forward. And then Rodney Brown from Cal just committed over the weekend, a six foot six, 180 pound wing. I'm not sure exactly what position he plays, but we're going to go with wing, maybe a three and D guy. I was pretty excited about both of these commitments. Yeah, both of them are three-point shooters, which fits Mike Young's system. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Burnham's a bit more developed. Uh, his coach left to go to Louisville. I think he's a guy who can slide in and you know be what Grant Pasilli was, be what Robbie Barron was, that style player. And then I think you know all we've heard about Rodney Brown is that. He's a bit of a project player, a lot of athleticism, can really shoot, got to clean up a lot of aspects of his game, though. So it's it's a test for Mike Young. Here you go, talented winger. Can you make this one work? And it'll be a test. So I think they're getting some guys. They're getting talented guys that other big-time programs are after, which is kind of how you can tell how good of a transfer pickup it is, who else is offering them. Yeah, definitely. A lot of, a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. I would say with Burnham, this guy is solid. He's played three years. Mm-hmm. He, his junior year, he was at about 12 points per game. Charleston was a good team. Four and a half rebounds, almost to steal a game. And you said the three-point shooting. He was 38% from mm-hmm. three over his three-year career. So a consistently that's, good shooter. That's that's not the volume of Hunter Couture, but that's about where Hunter Couture yeah, was. No, yeah, it's, it's maybe yeah. a percentage point here or there lower, but like it's solid. And then Rodney Brown, what impresses me about him, I know he's raw, but during his freshman year, he took 58 threes and he made 40%. Freshmen are notoriously bad shooters because they're adjusting to new gyms, they're young, their shot selection is usually poor, whatever. 40%. From three with that kind of volume, because he's only playing 14 minutes a game. Mm -hmm. So whenever he's getting in there, he's letting her rip and he's making 40%. Three years left of eligibility. I think he could be a really important player for tech down the road. If Mike young can develop him. And that's been the question, right? Can Mike young keep a guy in the program and develop him? The guys that he's had, even for short periods of time, have gotten better. We saw MJ Collins Mm -hmm. get better. We saw Tyler Nickel get better. And what I'll say about, Ben Burnham, last thing here is that his rating on the transfer, and I know this isn't perfect, but his transfer rating is the same as Tyler Nickel. It's the same as MJ Collins. So I don't view it as a downgrade. He's probably somewhere in between those guys. We we just talked about that in the last pod, Pete. Like yeah. <laughs> it's how this stuff works. Um it it makes the whole financial situation of the men's basketball program so frustrating because every single player who has stuck in Mike Young's program has gotten twofold better. I mean, Oluma couldn't even, Oluma couldn't dribble a ball and then was all (laughs) ACC. Justin Mutz, raw athlete, is now playing professionally. Lynn Kidd goes from like not even sniffing playing time at Clemson to a double digit scorer with ease in the ACC. Got a bag like, from Miami for, because of Mike Young. <laughs> I, I mean, Couture and Aline go from Wofford recruits to ACC champions and big time players. Like, oh, a national champion like, in Aline, by the way. And a national champion in Aline. Like, I don't, I, it, it makes it so frustrating because if you're just talking basketball, Mike Young's going to make you a good basketball player. Yeah. The issue is all the other stuff. And, Tech basketball has got to figure that out, and they they have about six months to do it. Not every transfer has been perfect. We know that Robbie Beeren maybe underwhelmed slightly. Uh, took Tyler Nickel a little time to get his feet under him, but once he did, I think he was moving towards the player we expected to get. I like these two pickups. Mm-hmm. That's where I'm at. There are two really, really nice pickups, value pickups. 
nine guys on the roster now, Sam. We've got a few more to go, but at least we can get, get almost there, scrimmage. Almost play five on five. Get a walk on in there. You got five on five, baby. Uh, but yeah, nine guys on the roster, four bigs, two point guards, and three wings as it stands now. But uh the wing position I am starting to feel good about. I really am. Like that, I, I like what we got in these two guys. They'll they'll figure it out. Um I, I think they have two good freshmen coming in who are guys who physically can play. Um, somewhat similar to Jaden Young, who he physically was ready to play in the ACC. So I think they'll they'll be okay. They'll be okay. It's a rebuilding year. They got to get their feet under them with this program, but they're going to be okay. I meant to say this earlier. Part of the great thing about this weekend was also running into a lot of people that said they enjoyed the pod. And I, I can't remember all the names, but I do remember, remember – Anne, who I met at the Rutgers game, her and her husband came up to me, said how much they still enjoy the show. That was great to hear. They said they're liking you, Sam. It's a little bit of a change, but they're dealing with it. <laughs> um, could, never, could never replace Robbie. <laughs> next man up mentality. Right, right. Um, but no, so so many of you came up and, and said hello. And I got to hang with a lot of people um, that, you know, from – all the various tailgate crews. You you guys know who you are, the people up on Chicken Hill. I I, I said a few names, Whistle Pig and and Karen and and Learning Life and all the all the fun people that I got to see up there. Uh, I got to hang out with Don V. I don't know if I said that earlier or not, but that was cool. Had never met Don before. Nice guy. Uh tech lover. You gotta love it, man. So that was what was cool about this weekend is to connect with so many people. That's what was, was so fun about our pregame show is that mm-hmm. all the, the voices that you hear and see on Twitter get to come together and, and be nerds together and, and maybe not socially awkward together for a few hours over some brewskis. <laughs> Can't ask for a better weekend, Pete. No, it was, it was a lot of fun. With that being said, we're going to close out the pod. Thank you for listening. Coach Holmes was awesome. I think people are really going to love this episode. If you're still here, make sure you like the video. Make sure you're subscribed, uh, following us on Twitter at 2 vt following us on Instagram at 2 vt And until next time, go Hokies. Go Hokies.